Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am recording, so I don't have um, as much time today as other days. So we're going to jump right in and answer questions. It's really good to be back with you all. So, um, so the first thing I wanted to share um, that's on my heart is is about something that the Lord has been speaking to me about, and that is when a person with a hard heart, we know that many times they are really adamant about trying to um, convince us that they are happy, trying to convince us that they are not in the wrong, that you know, that they may even tell you that God is um, released them for what they're doing. Um, but I went through something recently that um, I want to share a little bit about. Just just a little bit of personal stuff. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. But I'm going to say that I was struggling with being obedient to God. I was struggling with, you know, finding balance between doing my thing and what God was asking me to do and I did not go even near as close to hard-hearted as our, our hard-hearted spouses do and I can tell you that I was absolutely miserable that I could not get to enjoy being rebellious like you know I I couldn't get to enjoy the thing that I wanted to do fully it was like I could only partly enjoy it so when a spouse sits there and tells you that they are walking away from god they are being completely rebellious they are doing their own thing and that they are happy i don't buy it i don't buy it for one minute because you can only enjoy being rebellious so far then you have to enter into a state of anger and that's where i went i started to walk around angry because of the conviction I was feeling, right? So so now I'm angry. So now I'm not really enjoying what I was doing. I'm, I'm trying to the best of my ability to enjoy it, be disobedient. But now I'm angry that I'm being forced. So we also hear that so many times the, the hard-hearted spouse is, is angry. They're hostile. They're, you know, they, they walk in and they won't give you any eye contact or they're just rude and you know they're just they're just always in this place of 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 angst right and I and as I was go going through this myself all I could think about was how does the lost spouse keep this up for as long as they keep this up because I am pure miserable right now you know I want to enjoy my time away from being obedient to God, right? I know this is, sounds crazy, but I went through just a season, a small mini season where I wanted to just stop the ministry and just enjoy myself and, and be free from responsibility. I know it sounds crazy, but it's just what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do me. I wanted to be a rebellious person for a little while and not do any ministry, not be pulled on, you know, I just wanted to be left alone, right? And when we see this in our lost spouses, they don't want to provide, they don't want to bear responsibility, they don't want to do grown up, they just want to be a rebellious person and enjoy their time of rebellion, right? And I only did it for a couple weeks. Now, these spouses are doing it for years. So they have to literally enter into a state of anger, anger at God, anger at the person that they are feeling like if this person, if my wife, if my husband would release me from this responsibility, then I wouldn't have to fight God on it. I would be free and I could just go live my life in this other new life that I've chosen for myself 
and get to fully enjoy it. But no, I have to I have to only partially enjoy it. I have to face God constantly and and be under this condemnation and shame and guilt and that makes you angry. It makes you upset at the person that you feel you're bound to. And so, yes, you will do what you feel sometimes. Like if I just get that divorce, then God can't hold me accountable anymore. Or you have the spouse that goes above and beyond the opposite way. I'm going to make sure all my my spouse's bills are paid. I'm going to make sure that her car is running perfect. I'm going to make sure the kids, I see them. I check off all the boxes, right? Every single box that I feel provides guilt to me. Like I'm not spending enough time with the kids. I'm not paying the bills. I'm not, you know, doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm going to check off all all of those boxes. And when they're all checked, then I get to enjoy my rebellion without the guilt and the shame. Now, I saw this in my spouse. There was a season where he made sure that he checked off all the boxes so he could go out and disappear for three, four nights and not come home and and be guilt free. But guess what? It didn't work because he still felt guilty. And then he would come back. And again, you see him just working extra hard to check off all those boxes But it still wore him out. He still never got to fully enjoy himself in his rebellion. And then the anger started because he tried it his way. He thought, wow, if I go and I check off all the boxes, I do everything I'm supposed to do, then that's going to satisfy God. He's not going to pour on this guilt, this shame, this condemnation on me because I'm taking care of my wife. I'm taking care of my kids. I'm spending time with them. I'm doing all of this you know, the right way. But yeah, I'm still living my life for me. I'm still out having fun. I'm still doing my own thing. And so he couldn't be free. He couldn't be free to enjoy himself the way he wanted. Now, did I know that? No, because I saw, this is what I saw. I saw a man on his days off doing the yard, spending time with the kids, having this, this happy attitude And then for three days, he'd disappear. Two days, he'd disappear. And I wouldn't see him. And he'd come home and he'd be happy. Right? That's all I saw. This, this, And it would just wear me out because I was focused on him and focused on his happiness. And I was focused on this man, you know, this this, um, discouragement because, wow, this man is never going to change. There is no uh, conscious... Uh, guilt, no, no visible shame all over him. I didn't see the inward, the inward battle that was going on with him at this time. And that's where standers get so um, caught up. And you hear them say quite a bit, oh, my, my spouse um, has got no consequences. So you walk around trying to be that consequence, trying to, you know, do things that let them know that you're not happy, that they're doing something wrong. You make yourself a consequence. Now, I had learned right away that speaking my mind to him was not going to change him at all. So I learned other ways to make myself a consequence. And that was by being, um, you know, snarky under my breath or slamming things or giving him the silent treatment or, you know, just stupid little things like, okay, so he sends me a text. I'm going to not reply back for two, three hours. That's my way of showing him that I'm upset. You know, little read between the line messages, you know, these little stupid things we do or one liner. How are you today? And I would write back fine. Just, you know, my attitude just coming out in the way I typed it. And so I knew that that little one line little fine was going to send him the message I was trying to send him. It's crazy the ki- the type of things that we think we're we're sending, you know? And it's because they're in such a season of of hard-heartedness. They're not going to get the message like we're trying to put out there. And they're not going to get the consequence. In fact, that consequence that we give might even further um validate them 
in doing what they're doing. Why would I want to ever go home and be, you know, welcome or, or feel welcome and loved in that environment when when I walk in the door, all I feel is is her angry and trying to shame me and trying to make me feel guilty and they will rebel. They will rebel and say she's not going to make me feel guilty over this. She's not going to she's not going to guilt me. She's not going to put this on me, you know? So and they'll come up with ways to, you know, rebel against your being a consequence. So back to what I was saying, you know, it really is about you trying to find a way to put yourself in a position where you're trusting God with all of this and saying, you know, God, I just really don't understand how to live and how to navigate this every day on a level where I am walking in truth, but not letting the details of what they're doing convince me that they are absolutely enjoying their life scot-free, no consequences. I've got to find a way, God, to, to get truth into me and help me navigate this every single day, despite what I'm seeing from my spouse. And that really came about for me when I started to put my eyes on who I knew God to be, right? The more I learned about him, I was like, you know, God, if I'm created in your image and I'm not okay with this, you know, that means that you can't be okay with this either. And just because it's going on and it's not changing visibly to me, that doesn't mean that you're not behind the scenes doing something, working on my spouse's heart. There's got to be some truth to knowing that if you're not okay with something, God, then you are really are working where it where the work needs to be done. And that's where we need to focus and understand that God is digging at roots. We don't see it. God is digging at heart issues. We don't see it. We only see what is out there visible for us. You know, that photo plastered on their social media that is out there for the world to see with this big smile and this, you know, sitting at a bar and or at a party and, and the caption that says, having the best time of my life. That's what we see. And that will completely hurt us, right? It will completely hurt us because that's that's right there. And, and that's a message, right? And I know, let's talk about these messages. When I wanted to give that other person a message, I would go to my social media and make a public post because I had a great weekend with my spouse and I wanted her to know that. So I would make that message bright and loud and clear, right? But it didn't reflect the overall state of my heart. It didn't reflect the overall turmoil that I was going through. I was still in a storm. But yet I would post a picture of our family with the caption, best weekend ever. Because I wanted that other woman to know whatever it was at the moment that I was putting out there. And she would do the same. She would put a big old picture of herself smiling, you know, whatever, and a caption. So it was this battle. And it was so stupid now that I think about it, that we were trying to one-up each other. Who knows what we were trying to do? We were trying to let each other know, you know, I won this weekend. I got, you know, whatever I was after. It's ridiculous the battle the the you know that that you that you enter into because you're trying to you know get a message across to someone else or you go looking and you become defeated because they won they put up a social post that you know gave you the message that they're happy they're not happy they never you never get to have that true joy of the lord that is your strength and is your peace when you are living in sin, when you are living in a place that is totally in rebellion to God. You can portray it. 
You can take all the photos of you want, smiling, grinning, ear to ear, and write all that you want. But inwardly, inwardly, no. There's no way. Because you know why? God didn't create us to live in rebellion against him and get all of the benefit from that, right? There's no way. So you have to go back and rely on what and who God is and how the laws of reaping and sowing work. You reap what you sow. If you are sowing sin, rebellion, uh, living in your flesh, you are going to sow from that place. And then you can try to lie and hide it by saying, I'm happy, I'm blessed, I'm prospering. But you're, you're sowing sin, you're reaping destruction. And if you want to believe that destruction looks happy, then go ahead. But I'm not going to believe it, and you shouldn't believe it either. That's our accountability right there. That's up to us, guys. Your spouse is going. The other person is going to send a message loud and clear that they are blessed, they are content, they are happy, they are in the right. Whatever they want to hold on to and say, you were a bad husband, you were a bad wife. Now, because of that, I get to have this husband of yours. You know, you didn't provide, so now I get to have your wife and be her provider. You didn't, you didn't treat her right, so now I get to. You lost your chance, right? That's, that's the message that they're going to put out there. But you don't have to believe it. That's on you. How you react to their lies, how you react to their um, rebellion, their sin is on you. That is your journey with God. And I had to learn that because, boy, was I in this going to God, sniveling and crying all the time. Look what she wrote. Look what she did. Look at the text she sent. Look at the letter she wrote. Look at her. Look at her. Look at her. And God said, I'm seeing it. But let's talk about you and how you're reacting to it. Let's talk about you and how you're responding to her. She is controlling you. She's manipulating you through her manipulation and control. Let her do it. You don't have to fall for it. You don't have to respond to it. You don't have to react to it. Let her go. Get your eyes off of what the other woman is doing. We fall into jealousy. We fall into self-pity. We fall into complaining. We fall into whining. We fall into our own anger and rebellion. And then you wonder, we wonder, why am I ready to quit? Why am I exhausted? Why am I weary because we are falling for everything that's the enemy's throwing at us we're letting it get to us we're letting the details completely bog us down and weigh us down and it's really not what god wants for us he wants us to put our eyes our hope our focus and attention on him and who he is and what he's doing and his ability. He is so capable and able of everything that needs to be done. But yet we constantly call him liar. Because we see that our spouse appears to be happy. Or they tell us they're happy. Or they, or they might tell us they're miserable. They're so angry and hurt because they want to enjoy their life of sin. And they're so mad at God because God's not letting them. There's a lot of things that lost spouses will say. And we hear it. And we take it to heart. And we let it defeat us. And then we're crying for days. We're, we're, we're um, down in the pit. We're down in the dumps for days over something our spouse said. And then all of a sudden we're like, whoops, I forgot. I focused on the detail. I let that detail rope me in and weigh me down and drag me and become my anchor. 
at what point, and we don't even realize sometimes that we swapped out anchors. Jesus is our anchor. And sometimes we don't even realize that, that when we walk up and we look at that detail, that, that thing, we untie ourselves from our anchor of God and tie ourselves to that anchor of that detail. And the next thing you know, we're drowning. We're in the darkness. And we're wa wanting to quit. And we're just like, all of a sudden, we're like, oh my gosh, I did it again. I, I untethered from God. And I infused myself with this stupid detail that's irrelevant. I'm telling you, it's irrelevant. Do you know how many times I thought when I looked at something, I thought this is it. This right here, right here, this thing right here is going to destroy our marriage forever. It didn't. It didn't. It's irrelevant. When we put so much power sometimes into certain things and we take the power away from God. We put the power in what our spouse said. We put the power in what our spouse did. We put the power in how they feel about it. And we take it out of God's hands. We do that. The power never leaves him, but we do that. We take it out of our understanding. We take it out of our scope of ability to comprehend that God is still full of this power. We just lost sight of it and we took it from him in our own mind. Never from him. You can't take his power. But we take it away from our own comprehension. I hope I got that point across. You're never able to defeat God, to dethrone God. You're never able to remove his power. But you're, you're putting a block across your own mind and your own comprehension and where, where you believe you're falling for this lie that God doesn't have the power or the ability anymore. I've had people get so lost in the lie that they'll literally say, Sheila, does God want to save my spouse? Can God save my spouse? And when I question them and I ask them, where is this coming from? Well, my spouse is doing this. My spouse said that. My spouse doesn't, you know, he's angry or this or that. And it's like, okay, now you've put all of the power onto your spouse and you've completely forgotten about God and his ability, his capability. If you have to sit every morning and remind yourself that God created the heaven the earth, the universe, the people, the animals. Go over, do what you need to do to create this, this proof. Walk outside and look. Just look up at the sky. Look at the trees. Look at the, you know, breathe in the air. Everything that God created this perfect environment for you to survive in. And you're going to say that he can't work on your spouse's heart because your spouse said something to you that totally puts you in a place of unbelieving God. That's how defeated we get when we focus that we completely make God the size of a, of a, of a pea, of an ant. And we make our spouse the size of God. We swap them out. I did that constantly. I would be praising God, magnifying him, making him enormous, right? In power, giving all that ability and capability to him. My spouse would come home. I would take one look at his happy face and bam, swap. Now he was God and he had the power and I lost. I don't even know where God is right now. Is there a God? Sometimes I would actually get into a place of I would completely forget there was even a God. I was so fixed and focused on how happy my spouse was, how rebellious he was and enjoying himself. Sometimes I went straight to my spouse and all hell broke loose. Sometimes I, I found my way and I would go to my room, get on my face and say, God, help me. Help me get my eyes off of what I just saw. Help me get my heart 
and my mind back on you. And I would pull myself back out of this place and God would start to magnify, be magnified, be magnified. And I would say, God, and I would, I would have to go over and encourage myself and regain because I believed what I saw. We do that, and it's a battle, and it is a battle. Sometimes just that look on my husband's face instilled so much fear in me. The fear of, is he ever going to change? Is he ever going to be free from this darkness? Is he ever going to find his way back to God again? The fear of that alone would keep me bound in the detail. But again, I was so fixed and hyper-focused on that fear. Will he ever putting all the power in that question, not, God, this is your son, and I know you have a plan for him. You've got to learn the moment you are in the question, will this ever change? Will my spouse ever? Will my spouse? Will my spouse? You've got to go and start asking God the questions. And making the, the answer become available. God, will my spouse ever change? Of course he will. Because you want my spouse to change. And you're working on my spouse's heart. You've got to answer those questions, guys, with the truth. And not with the truth of what the enemy says. Not with the truth of what your spouse said. A lot of times we answer the question, will my spouse ever change? No, because my spouse told me that he loves this other person and he loves his new life. And you sit there and you tell this to God. So, no, God, my spouse is never going to change. You answer your own questions with what your spouse says and not with what God says. <coughs> That's something that we have to work on. Your spouse is not going to fix that in you. You've got to work on that. You've got to work on why you would believe your lost, in the dark, rebellious spouse over the God of the universe, who's all truth, all love, all knowing, all capable. Why are you not believing God? You have an unbelief issue. You have a trust issue. You have a faith issue. You have an inexperience issue with your father. The same exact problem that your spouse has, but yet we're hyper-focused on their problem, not ours. We're hyper-focused on God, save my spouse, fix my spouse, bring my spouse to you when we are going through pretty much the same struggles they are. This is why we say over and over, and over and over and over and over. Leave your spouse to God because you've got enough work to keep you busy on you, your own issues in your own heart. You've got enough to keep you busy. Those reactions that come from us, every single time we have an ungodly reaction, it's something in us that's being exposed that needs work on. I spent so much time in the beginning complaining about my spouse to God. And God constantly was redirecting me back to me. It frustrated the heck out of me. I wanted God to tell me about my husband. I wanted God to tell me, yeah, this will be over in a week, Sheila. Don't worry. It's, it's good. No, seven more years of this is what I went through. Today is my 32nd anniversary. My husband and I have been together 32 years. I am about to be 52. So we have been together more than half our life. And I celebrate God. I don't celebrate my marriage. I celebrate God. Because, boy, I'm going to get real teary over this. So through my marriage, I learned of God's love for me. 
I learned of his passion for me, his devotion to me, his care for me. These are all things that when I, I woke up at 3 a.m. and uh, I started thinking about my children and this fear, this fear comes over me about my kids, about this world that they're growing up in and just a lot of fear. So I'm probably emotional because I've been up since 3 a.m., but that's okay. And I just, I just was sitting there and I just had so much fear. And God said, you know, Sheila, they're my kids. They're my kids. My kids are his kids. And I have to, I have to let him have this fear of the unknown. Because I am older. I'm going to be 52. My youngest is nine. I was late. I was a late uh, mom. We were late parents. And this fear of not being there for them. You know, it's, it's real. Gosh, I'm, guys, I'm so sorry that I'm crying. Um, but this fear that I have of not being there for my children. I have to get out of that fear and put the focus on God's ability to be there for my children when I'm not, right? The same with every area that we face in our life. If we put our focus on the fear, on the problem, then we're robbing God. We're robbing ourselves of this place of peace. So when I woke up at 3 a.m. and I started thinking about, you know, time and, and my children and the fears. I was putting all of that energy into the problem and not the solution. And the solution is that your spouse is God's child. He loves your spouse. He loves you. And he wants the best for you. He wants the best for you. So you have to trust him with how he works that out. And you can't do that if you're trusting the detail. You can't do that if you're trusting that they're happy in their sin and they're being blessed in their sin. That's not how it works. God made it so it wouldn't work that way for a reason. We have to trust in that. We have to trust in who he is. He did not create sin to bring a bountiful harvest like we think it does. Sin brings devastating consequences. Devastating. I just entered in a small season of sin for the last couple weeks. And I was devastated to a point where I was like walking around going, this is ridiculous. I don't know how lost people walk away from God. They literally have to turn the hardest of hearts to get through this and live this life. But you can see it all over some of them, right? They're angry. They're drinking. You know how many spouses turn into drinkers, drug addicts, or go into depression to cope with being rebellious? Or they just are constantly angry. There's so much they turn into, into this other person. We have a lot of spouses that enter into places like that. My spouse did. The day he hardened his heart to marriage, God, he opened the door to so many strongholds and he still battles today. He still battles the stronghold of alcohol today. Which is very, very sad. And I'm I'm putting my my focus on God's ability to deliver him, not my husband's ability. Because when I put my focus on the ability that my husband has to set himself free, I get very discouraged. Because right now, it doesn't look like my husband wants to be free. It looks like he's happy in his stronghold. And if I put my eyes on that, 
I get very discouraged. I get very defeated. I get very angry. And I walk around in this place of, of anger, which affects my whole entire life. And I'm going to be real. That's kind of what triggered me to go into this place of rebellion. I got to a point where I just, you know, God, it's been nine years. Actually, it's been longer than that. He started drinking in 2008 and he's been in this bondage. And I got to the point where I was like, God, I, I just need a break. I need a break from being angry. I need a break from being discouraged. And instead of focusing on God's ability, I focused on me and just taking a break. And I could feel it the second I did that, that I was walking away from so many different things. And that's when I opened the door to being condemned. I opened the door to being guilty. I opened the door to feeling shame. And I, instead of getting my way back to God, I opened the door to being angry and rebellious. And it pushed me even further from God. So that's where some of you have reached out and said, Sheila, where have you been the last few weeks? Well, I've been in my own little mini crisis. My own little mini aggravation. Because I got upset that it's been all these years and I haven't seen the change in my spouse that I wanted to see. And then this is in regards to his stronghold of drinking, not our marriage. And I lost sight that he's in a bondage. And I took it personal and I made it about me. And we do that. And we, we sometimes handle our discouragement, our um, aggravation, in, in not so good of a way. And we have these little mini meltdowns and we lose ourselves. And I just got tired of feeling a little bit miserable. So I entered in a little state of rebellion to make myself feel better. But guess what? I didn't get to enjoy it. And this was the whole point of my message. I didn't get to enjoy my state of rebellion like I wanted to. I wanted to just be happy. I wanted to just enjoy my life free from the misery of watching the stronghold devour my husband. It didn't work. I didn't get to enjoy my, my rebellion. Your spouse, they're not enjoying their rebellion. As much as they try to convince you, let them. It's irrelevant. You know why they can't enjoy it? Because they weren't created that way. They weren't DNA'd that way. They weren't blueprinted that way. And that's thanks to God. That's thanks to our Father who created us in his image. Unless your spouse is the son of Satan and created in Satan's image, then yeah, I guess your spouse can enjoy their sin. But I'm pretty sure you would know that when you met them and married them that they were the son of Satan, right? You would know that. Because evil would be part of them inside and out, upside down, inside out. They would shun everything good, everything holy, everything righteous. They would hate light. They would be completely in the dark and consumed by darkness. I know some of you freaked out when I said, if you know, you married the son of Satan because it is a biblical. It, it talks about it in the Bible, sons of Satan. An unbeliever is not the same thing as the son of Satan. Please understand that. Please understand that. An unbeliever is just an unbeliever. They haven't encountered God. Doesn't mean that they're a son of the enemy, okay? But you'll know, I'm telling you, you will know. When you have a spouse who's righteous, who's good, 
who's honest, who's caring, who's loving, right? And all of a sudden, they completely transform into what you're now thinking, oh my gosh, they're the son of Satan. No, no, that's just the hard heart. They have been turned over Satan, right? The word says that that they get turned over to Satan. That's not the same thing. You know God's children. Even, even as an unbeliever. When I was an unbeliever, guys, I was still God's child. Because he predestined me. He handpicked me. He foreknew me. It's all in there. It's all in the word. Do you know that even as a young girl, young God was speaking to me and I could hear him. I didn't really recognize who it was, but this was before I gave my life to God. So you hear God and you know God's voice even before you give your heart to him because you're still his child. So your spouse can't enjoy that life apart from God's will. They can't. Don't let them try to convince you otherwise. Don't let the enemy try to convince you. Don't let that photo on social media. Don't let your, the report of your children when they come back and they say, we had the best weekend with dad or we had the best time with mom. That other man, you know, they did this and or we had the best time. Don't, don't fall for it. Yeah. Now, when I say don't fall for it, of course, it's going to hurt. All right. There's nothing, there's not, God is not saying, oh, you have no right to hurt over this. He's not saying that. Of course, you have a right to hurt. Your children spent time in a situation that they were never created to spend time in, right? Yes, that's going to hurt, but we have to keep in balance. If that hurt is now being transformed into unbelief or a lie you're putting too much power into the lie. You absolutely have every right to hurt. Holidays are coming up. Let's talk about that for a minute. You absolutely have every right to hurt that your spouse is sitting at someone else's table. Your children might be sitting at someone else's table. But don't fall for the lie that your spouse doesn't know this is wrong. That he's 100%. She is 100% enjoying her, her life. Nope. I remember a testimony from a woman who said that Thanksgiving, she excused herself from the table, went into the bathroom and broke down and had the cry, a cry over the fact that she wasn't home with her, her husband and children, went back out, sat down, right when they snapped a photo of her and she wrote she shared this photo and she said you would never think that I had just come out of the bathroom crying over this emptiness in my soul that I was not home with my husband and children and that photo got shared and everybody saw it and her husband filed for divorce because of that photo. Is that not incredible? He had no clue. He took one look at that photo and said, she's happy with the other man sitting at their table. I'm done. Had no clue she had just come out of the bathroom weeping. She had some amazing makeup, in my opinion, that did not show that she had, you know. But that's, that's just something off topic. But anyway... Do you guys see what my point is? He filed for divorce because of a photo that told him a lie that goes against God's nature of reaping and sowing, right? That's his on him. He believed the lie, not God. He believed the lie not the law of reaping and sowing. He believed the lie, not God's character. He believed the lie, not who God blueprinted and created us. You sow what you reap. He believed the lie. And guess what? Because of that, he then filed for divorce. 
So he fell into the deception. Now, how should he have handled it? He could have cried. He could have wept over that, that his wife appeared happy. He could have went to God and said, Lord, she appears happy. Is this true? And then he could have answered his own question. She can't be happy. She can't be happy to the point where she's reaping and sowing. Sin reaps destruction. And that's exactly what she had been experiencing five minutes before that photo. And I'm sure she felt it throughout the whole night that she wasn't at home with her family. You've got to answer those questions that keep plaguing you. Are they really happy? Are they really enjoying themselves? Are they not getting consequences? My spouse told me that he could go to where he was going, but he was up all night, couldn't sleep, pacing the floor. And I felt that sometimes. I could hear him up pacing. He'd wake up the next, I'd wake up the next day and he would tell me, I'm not doing this anymore. I didn't sleep. He was even afraid. He even told me he felt God was going to kill him, take him out. But that didn't stop him. That was early in. The, in. He did still kept going for another six years, seven years. So it, it's all a work in progress. It's all a heart conditioning and all, all changing of the heart. And so I would get a lot of hope when I heard my husband say, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. That was, you know, I, I had so much guilt. I was up all night. God's going to take me out. It's just, I would just, oh, this is it. This is the change. And then six more years of that. And then I would even get the opposite where he would say, I'm so happy. I'm doing great. Everything's perfect. He wouldn't even mention God. And then I would become completely destroyed over that. We have to be accountable to the truth. And the truth doesn't come from a lost spouse at all. None of it. None of it. Because five minutes later, their truth is going to shift and, and be different. They're double-minded. They're anchored to rebellion. They're anchored to their own flesh. They're anchored to the enemy. They're anchored to so many different things. And if you put your um, anchor on them, guess what? You're going right down to the pit with them. You've got to be anchored to God, and you've got to know when you have removed that anchor and put it on something else. So I'm going to go through the comments. I know there's a lot, and I missed as I was kind of going off on this message. So they live with a foot in both worlds, right? To the point where they are trying to please you, please them. Work this out perfectly on this end. Work this perfectly out on that end. If the wife's not happy, they work to make the wife happy. If the, the, the other woman's not happy, they work to make... And they are doing all of this, right? Because they want to keep their sin. They want to keep the guilt away. They want to keep the shame away. That's what I was sharing earlier about how you'll have a spouse work and check off all the boxes. And so sometimes in situations like this, God has to work with the stander to pull back some of the, of the behaviors that they might be helping that spouse check off those boxes. And that's, that's, this is why there's no rules in standing because what works for one standard doesn't work for another. When you've got a spouse who has worked super hard to make sure that they are comfortable in their sin, having a foot in both places, their children are provided, both, both uh, a spouse and other person are both happy, as happy as they can be in their minds, 
and they're doing this, they can go quite a while. They'll exhaust themselves, but they're they're working really hard creating this this place. And if this if the stander is not mindful, they could be in, in, in a place where they're helping that spouse achieve all that by zipping their lips or there's just it's just kind of a different I'm working with a particular stander who's in that situation now and some of the things had to change. Some of the things that she was doing had to change. So it, it's just a kind of a different situation. It's not easy. It's a harder situation. Um, I, I can't really, th that this could be a whole different topic, a whole different workshop, a whole different, you know, teaching on this, but it's really an individual basis. You have to know, God, am I helping my spouse to be completely comfortable every time they feel guilty are they coming to me to ease their guilt and I'm giving them what they need? So it's a it's a place where you have to be careful because you can fall into manipulation. You can fall into control. It's really, um, it's not easy. When you have a spouse who's living comfortable in both places. Now, I'm not saying that they're living without... Um, they're living a hundred percent happy. They're living, you know, that, cause that's the whole point of this message is that God didn't create us to be happy in our sin. He didn't create us to reap and sow, you know, prosperity and blessing when we are reaping and sowing sin, but they will do their best to keep that consequence at bay. And they will really run amok with constantly trying to keep both parties, you know, comfortable. And we have to watch it. I've seen standers bend over backwards because they're so happy now to have that spouse halfway. They're so happy to have that one foot that they live in a place of, well, if I can't have both feet, I'm happy with one foot and I'm going to do what with whatever it takes to not lose that one foot. And I hope that makes sense. But I've seen standards do that where they where they are so afraid of losing that one foot that they gained. And the same with the other person. The other person's like, well, I had both feet. Now I've only got the one foot in this in this life from him. So and I don't want to lose that. So I won't stop pressuring him to leave his wife as long as I get the one foot. And now this and now that lost spouse it feels like, okay, I can have this forever. I can love two women, especially if there's a child involved with the, with the new person. I've got to stay one foot involved now because of the new child. It's a really tricky situation. Um, can we have your spouse remove his foot out of that affair, out of that adultery, still be a parent, still repent? Absolutely. And that's what God is trying to get. Sometimes that stander has to address, am I living life following the wisdom of God or am I living life in fear, following fear? If I confront, if I show my spouse I'm not happy with one foot, am I afraid he's going to pull that one foot out? Am I, is my children now going to lose their parent because I'm, you know, doing it this way because I'm not going to live in fear. I'm being ruled by fear. A lot of times these spouses that live with one foot in both worlds, are master manipulators. They know that the second you start to throw a fuss, they're going to threaten you and say, well, I'm just going to pick both my feet now and put them back in the other place. Because if you're not happy with me living in both places, then I'm going to punish you by removing myself. I'm going to punish the kids by removing. Remember where it, how it used to be when I had no contact with you and I didn't have anything to do with you and I was divorcing you and I was this and that. We'll go back to that. They're master manipulators. And so the standard has to play by a different set of guidelines. I even hate the word, use the word play. I shouldn't have used that word. They have to follow the wisdom of the Lord. And it's a different, whole different scenario. So...